it's a question for you, James. Um, you mentioned that the um, the government are refining the weapons. Yeah. And I wonder how that relates to cluster bombs. Um. To be more specific. <laughs> Um, cluster bombs, uh, I guess, um, have a very specific uh, use. Um, I can't sort of thought they were banned, but there's a difference between banning something and using something, I guess. Um, but, you know, if a cluster bomb is used to wipe out uh, a battalion of troops, it's probably the best way to do it if on the ground. But I don't know, I don't really know how to answer that. So, um, you don't have an answer for um, government refining their weapons when it comes to dropping cluster bombs over villages, say, civilians? Um, I can only assume that they will drop those kind of weapons if they felt there was a, a military target within, within that village. I can't imagine them doing it just for uh, the sake of it or accidentally. And uh, along that line, I'd ask um, why the continued use of depleted uranium in, in the weapon? Um, I think I'd like to think that's an, an expense issue. It's probably the best way to uh, to um, recycle the uranium. Uh, and then it doesn't allow you to. It doesn't. You don't have to worry about the, you know burying it in the ground or the expense of. Uh, Recycling it somehow. So I'm it's sure the most cost effective way of, uh, of getting rid of depleted uranium. Surely the long term effects of this uh, depleted uranium, they aren't being got rid of, they're just hanging around in the environment and uh, contaminate the people and the species and the environment. Yeah, yeah, but it's far more spread out. Like, you know, it's all over the place rather than. Well, isn't that even more worrying that depleted uranium is spread out all over? Um, yeah, but it's a cost issue, is it? Is it human life all over, or <laughs> just to how much the arms manufacturers put on their weapons? Yeah, I, I think it does have a uh, tactical advantage as well to put it on the weapon, it makes it more effective. Arm um, okay, so. yeah, yeah, sure, sure, but uh, that's, that, that doesn't justify leaving it behind to contaminate the people on the land. There's no clean up operation, is <coughs> Uh, not at present, no. I think some of these are very, very good and valid points and how these things spent on two thousand millions or billions of years of moving forward. Uh, I think once we, we need to uh, deal with some of the earlier issues on this to then a much, much longer term issues there. But, um, I've got some question, question two for Chris and possibly for James. Um, so, coming a bit to Holly's question, because, um, do you feel that the government set out and intended to wipe out part of a nationality, as in genocide, or they, was it set out economically motivated? Like we heard the Chilcot inquiry <coughs> over four large oil multinationals, I think Shell, Exxon, BP, two years before, encouraged government departments to get involved with the bailing Iraq. So is it more, as I was saying, an economic argument going in for oil? rather than um, a setting out to genocide and wipe out a part or a whole of a, of, of, of a nationality. And as a sort of um, substat, could, they, could the countries then be prosecuted for mass murder as opposed to genocide? If, if they change the, re the reason, say, economic instead of racial or national, then what would the process be? What would the, you be charging them with instead of genocide? That, that's one of the other part of my question. Oh, basically. No, it's good. No, it's good. What else? I just want to say it. The, the other part is we need to look at whether this is a crime of genocide, as you very clearly outlined all the four criteria, but also that, you know, it seems that they condemn themselves out of their own mouths with uh, opposite crimes of aggression and could be prosecuted for murder, but there are also the other, the other you know, uh, crimes that could be charged with conspiracy to murder, incitement to murder, incitement to commit a crime against humanity, complicity in a crime against peace, and many other offences in common law and custody international law. My question would be, why are we, why are we going for the genocide um, charge rather than seven charges of crimes against humanity and the rest has just been outlined? 
Yes, two very good points. There are two parts to it which is important. I'll take the first bit you know, about the motivation. And there is a very, it's important to distinguish between motivation and intent in law. And that is why, for the first time in English law, Section 66, which defines intent, was put into the legislation. And I'll just remind you what it is. Again, we went over it, it's at the top of page 12. A person has intent in relation to conduct where he means to engage in the conduct. Now, let's just take that statement. You don't have to say why he's engaging in the conduct. You have to say he means to engage in that conduct. So, what his reasons are, uh, we'll never know. It may be that he had been passed a um, promise to have 25 million a year as a peace envoy around the world for the rest of his life. <laughs> we'll never know the motivation, but what we can prove is his, that he meant to engage in the conduct. He meant it because he repeated it over and over and over again. So that is the definition of intent. It's got nothing to do with his motivation about oil or anything else. Plus he knows the consequences of that. Uh, well, that's where it comes into the second thing, in relation to a consequence, where he means to cause a consequence. Or, you may say, well, I never meant to kill anybody. But the point is that if he's aware that it will occur in the ordinary course of events, if you fire 100,000 cruise missiles and bombs and rockets into a country, and you expect it to have no effect at all, well, then fine, you may be able to argue that. But he knew perfectly well over and over again, got engaged in that conduct of firing cruise missiles, knowing that the consequence was that it would lead to explosion and deaths and injuries to men, women, and children. And it was reported in the press over and over again, and he continued to do it. So it's very important to distinguish between, a lot of people say, oh, well, we went into Iraq for the oil and so on. Why we went into Iraq is irrelevant in proving genocide. It's to do with his intent, which is very different from his motivation. In light of the comment that he said, that, uh, that Jack Straw said that... Can he, I, I, I need to come to the second half of the, <laughs> the, <laughs> the question. <laughs> the, the, the big question is why genocide, really, in a sense? Rather than the lesser... Uh, so there are lots of other crimes. Yeah. Uh, and all of those, I believe, uh, can be prosecuted. I believe that this is the single... Uh, most important issue the world has to face today. Warfare goes all the way around this world constantly. We spend more on war and prosecuting war than anything else. And it's only when one Western leader is held to account for what they've done will we eventually bring an end to war. So I personally think not only is genocide it's a word that every English person will avoid. No one can possibly understand in this country how important that word is. We avoid it. Oh, the British never commit genocide. No, that's for somebody else. You know, that happens in Africa or elsewhere, but never in Britain. But the point is, it's happening every day. It has been happening every day since 1998. We have been bombing and killing people because of their nationality. And what I'm concerned about is that when we as a nation sign up to, say, the Genocide Convention, promising never ever to commit genocide, and then we just carry on committing genocide, there is a, a, a huge gap between our behavior and our promises. We've got to do something about that. And the second thing is most important. Genocide in Iraq was really steered by George Bush, Dick Cheney, and the uh, American citizens. And remember, they are not um, signatories, sorry, they haven't ratified the, uh, the Rome Statute. But they have ratified the Genocide Convention Implementation Act in America in 1988, which is called the Proxima Act. And so what I want to do is to make sure that not only our leaders on this side of the Atlantic are prosecuted for genocide and the crimes they've committed, 
But the American citizens who see this program and others start to realize that their own domestic criminal law, under it, they can prosecute any one of their leaders who commits genocide. And that includes George Bush, um, Clinton, both Mrs. and Mr. and Obama and all the rest of them. Just a sort of general question um, about weapons uh, manufacturers. Are these uh, weapons manufacturers not also by knowing they're making the weapon? Absolutely. We know perfectly well why intent is very easy. If you know perfectly well that your uh, cruise missile, manufactured by BAE or whatever it is, is going to be used to kill people, then you are committing a crime of conduct ancillary to genocide. So I would hope that not only do we start to focus on our leaders, our political leaders, but we start to focus on the directors of BAE and all the manufacturing and companies and trading companies and supply companies who are ensuring that our armed forces can carry on committing the worst crime known to mankind. 